Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Professor Haslick. I want to thank the Show Me Institute and St. Louis University for having me, and I thank all of you for coming. The goal of my remark this evening is to provide an assessment of the economic policies that the Clinton, excuse me, the Obama administration, <laughs> <laughs> the Obama administration uh, has pursued in the last uh, year and a couple of months. Okay. To do that, I want to start with an observation. Okay. When President Obama took office, okay, he was in an unusual situation. He obviously faced a bad economy. I don't think it was nearly as bad as the administration suggested. I don't think we were on the verge of another Great Depression, but it certainly was a serious recession, worse than just about any others uh, in the post-World War II period. Okay. At the same time, President Obama faced very high expectations. There was a view, pretty widely held, that somehow he had a magic wand that he was going to be able to accomplish things that many other politicians had not been able to accomplish. He entered office with a huge amount of hope and trust, obviously from Democrats, from liberals, but much more broadly than that. Lots of independents voted for him. Lots of independents thought that this was a person who was impressive, a, per a person who might really make a difference for uh, the country's future. And of course, he also entered office with a strongly Democratic Congress, okay, a much greater majority in both houses than just about any other president has enjoyed in recent memory. Okay. Uh, so in all these respects, he faced uh, a bit of a unique uh, starting point. Now, the bad economy, the high expectations, you can of course think of as a bit of a burden or a challenge. Okay, if everybody expects miracles, then it's pretty likely you're going to fail no matter how well you do. At the same time, the hope and the trust and the Democratic majority provided an opportunity. Okay, it meant that he might be able to do some things okay, that hadn't been done before. So the question was, how was the president going to use this unusual situation? And there were basically two possibilities. One option, it would have been to choose a, a range of policies to at least advocate for a set of things that most people sort of recognize are necessary, but nobody wants to speak in favor of, okay? At least no one who ever wants to get elected to public office again. So the obvious example is slowing the growth of entitlement spending in the U.S., slowing the growth of spending on Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. Many Democrats, know what the, no matter what they say in front of the microphones, realize that something needs to be done about those programs or they will eat the entire budget. Okay, but none of them okay, wants to stand up okay, and advocate for that. Okay, but Obama was in a somewhat unique position. Maybe he, sort of more than anyone else, had a chance to say, look, it's time to pay the piper. I'm going to take one for the team. I'm going to rise above bipartisanship. And I'm going to advocate slowing the growth of those programs. A second option, of course, was for President Obama and the Democratic Congress to use their unusual situation, in particular the trust and support as well as the strong majority, to ram through whatever policies they thought were desirable from the perspective of their constituents okay, without much regard for whether these were beneficial for the overall economy. In the language of my title, the title of my talk, they could have chosen to emphasize growth, to emphasize growing the economic pie, producing more stuff, making the economy more productive and efficient. Or they could have emphasized dividing the pie, redistribution. Not necessarily just redistribution from high income to low income, but redistribution <coughs> to favored Democratic interest groups because perhaps that helps you get reelected the next time around. Mm -hmm. My claim, my main argument is that the administration has chosen the latter option. It is focused almost exclusively on redistribution, on paying off its base, not on doing policies, enacting policies that would have expanded the economy, promoted a faster growth rate, and given us a better economic situation going forward. Of course, the administration has typically, almost always, tried to dress up their policies as being about making things more efficient. They've tried to argue that their vision of policy will make it better, will make it more efficient, will get bigger bang for the buck, will give everybody more of something without anyone feeling any pain. Okay? In a few cases, they have reasoned, although I don't think compelling, arguments that some of their policies might make sense from a productivity efficiency perspective. Okay? But overall, I want to argue that they have systematically chosen redistribution okay, over economic growth, over economic productivity. And this applies whether we're talking about the stimulus, about Obamacare, about housing policy, about the auto bailouts, about banks, about cap and trade, and so on and so forth. That is, the choices demonstrate a consistent tilt toward redistribution over growth. I'm going to try to make this case by talking about some specific policies. I will mainly focus on the stimulus, partially because that's the 
single biggest policy that actually has been enacted. Many of the other things the administration has advocated for okay, are still sort of on the drawing board at one level or another, are still languishing in Congress, to be more specific. But I'll also talk about a number of these other things that the administration has endorsed, even if they haven't yet become, become law. And then I want, to, I want to talk about what I think the US's economic future looks like, okay, given okay, my conclusions about the way the Obama administration has conducted business for the, at least the first part of their term. So the first policy worth discussing is the fiscal stimulus. It's about $800 billion, give or take $100 billion. You know, as Robert Dirksen said, $100 billion here, there, soon you're talking about real money. Okay? Um, when Obama took office, the US was in a serious recession. Monetary policy had done pretty much everything that most economists thought it could do. So it was not unreasonable to discuss fiscal policy, even though fiscal policy has sort of been ignored by macroeconomists for a good 15, 20 years. But it was certainly a reasonable thing to discuss. It was certainly a, a totally sensible thing to worry whether government could do something to help end the recession faster rather than slower. So let's talk about the stimulus. Okay? And first, let's just ask, what exactly is a fiscal stimulus? It's an idea due to John Maynard Keynes, a famous uh, British economist, wrote roughly in the first half of the 20th century. And it means one of two things. It means either that the government expands its purchases, okay, its spending, more roads, more military expenditure, more education spending, and so on. Or it means that the government cuts taxes okay, so that individuals have more disposable income or corporations and other business firms have more after-tax cash flow that they can use on, to spend on whatever they wish. And the idea in both cases is basically the same. The idea is that when either the government buys more stuff from the private sector or individuals and firms get to keep more of their income because they pay less in taxes, they'll take some of that okay, and they'll buy stuff with it. And when they buy stuff with it, that will be extra income to the people who sold it. Okay? And those people who sold the new toaster ovens to the people who just got a tax rebate or a tax cut will turn around and use some of their extra profit to buy some goods and services for themselves. And then those people will have a little bit of extra income. So you get what's known as a multiplier effect. This initial injection into the economy by the federal government in the form of either more purchases of goods and services or lower taxes multiplies through the economy and leads to the stimulation of the private production of goods and services throughout the economy and giving you more than one for one, giving you more back in terms of extra output than the extra amount that the government spent or the, extra, or the amount that the government cut in taxes. So what you can obviously see is that before you decide for sure that you're doing a fiscal stimulus, you have to decide well, exactly what kind of fiscal stimulus. Is it going to be a tax cut? Is it going to be a spending increase? Is it some of both? Does it matter what kind of spending or what kind of tax cut? And so on. It turns out that in the Keynesian logic, if you take it literally, if you read any introductory textbook written by any economist from the most conservative to the most liberal, they basically all say exactly the same thing on this point. They say it doesn't matter at all. They say that any kind of extra spending by the government stimulates the economy and any kind of tax cuts by putting more disposable income in the hands of businesses and firms helps stimulate the economy. So if that's true, then quibbling over exactly how we spent the stimulus money, okay, quibbling over which tax to cut or whether to do spending or cutting taxes, is kind of a waste of time because if the Keynesian model is literally right, anything you do in either of those two categories is useful. So when you see stories on CNN or Fox News or wherever about some really insane thing that the fiscal stimulus is going for, the most recent one I saw was for yoga lessons in Massachusetts. Okay? That makes sense in the Keynesian logic because those yoga instructors got a little bit more income from the federal government and therefore those yoga instructors are going to buy more groceries or get a slightly more expensive apartment or buy a new toaster oven and then the people who sell toaster ovens have a little bit more income and that will multiply through the economy. So under the strict Keynesian logic, it really makes no difference. All the Fox News horror stories about the silly things the stimulus might have been spent on are actually irrelevant if you accept the pure Keynesian logic. Okay? What I want to argue is that there's a lot more to it than that and that we should care very deeply okay, what we use, what we put into a fiscal stimulus, whether it's taxes versus spending, okay, and what kind of taxes versus spending. So I want to focus first on the spending side. It turns out there are really two arguments that advocates for the stimulus made back in January, February. Okay, and they're very different arguments, but they were almost always mushed together and confused. One argument for extra government spending says the government has good things to do. 
Okay? We need more roads. We need to have more teachers per pupil, so we need more spending on education. We need more green energy, so should we should be subsidizing wind farms or things like that. Okay? The second argument, the one I just explained, the strict Keynesian argument, okay, says it doesn't matter what we spend on as long as we spend more. The first one I'll refer to as the cost-benefit argument. It just says the government may have good projects that it can carry out that the private sector for some reason is not carrying out. Okay? That's one argument. The different argument is the Keynesian argument. If you go back and look at what people were saying about the spending, you'll see very clearly those two things were often muddied together in the advocacy for the stimulus. Now let's consider the first claim, that there's lots of good projects, that there was set five, six, eight hundred billion dollars worth of additional spending that the government should have been doing just because it was good spending for the government to be doing. If that was true, if the government has new roads that would really be productive for the economy, of course the government should build those roads. Okay? If it turns out that more government spending for education, say more loans for people to go to college, are really going to add to the overall productivity of the economy, then of course having the government provide those loans okay, is a perfectly fine idea. Okay? It has nothing to do with the recession. It has to do with the fact that in some cases, the private sector might not do certain things that would be productive for the overall economy that maybe the government can do. Roads is a pretty standard example, a pretty convincing example. Okay, for any individual or any company to get all the permissions to build roads across all the way across the country might be somewhat overwhelming. Maybe you need government to coordinate a project like that. Okay. But okay, my judgment is that in fact, relative to where the US was, is approximately now, the notion that there was lots of additional productive spending is incredibly unpersuasive. Okay? So I want to explain that view, my claim that in practice, in fact, okay, in the US economy in 2009, there was hardly anything that the government should have been spending more money on, okay? and therefore the cost-benefit argument for stimulus okay, is not convincing. So why do I say that? First of all, it's important to emphasize that the question is not whether some government expenditure is a good idea. Some size military, some amount of government roads, some amount of government support for education. The question was, should we have done much more starting from where we already were with very high levels of all those things okay, in 2009? Clearly you can make a case that we should have some government spending on roads, but that doesn't justify building zillions of roads. It doesn't say that we should spend enough money to repair every road system every six months. Because doing that means you interfere with traffic all the time and you don't make the road much better, so the cost would be much greater than any benefit from that extra spending on roads at some point. So where do we think the U.S. is? Why should we think that the U.S. is probably not underspending and maybe overspending, okay? taking into account that there's going to be diminishing benefits of additional spending on any given category? Mainly because there clearly are very strong, powerful interest groups that are constantly pushing for more spending. So there's clearly a bias toward spending okay, for it to be too much rather than too little. For building projects, for road projects, construction companies and unions, of course would love the government to build new roads every single day, no matter what, to have the entire sort of country paved with superhighway, because that's good for that particular interest group. Okay? Teachers unions would like to convince everyone that class sizes as low as 15 or 10 or 5 okay, are really much better than class sizes of 25 because then there's a lot more demand for teachers and that's good for teachers unions. Okay? Academics, economists included, they're just as guilty as everyone else, would like to convince everyone that there's always more good research to be done that the private sector won't fund okay, and therefore the government should fund it. Why? Because that's good for academics. It pays our summer salaries, it gives us research assistance and new computers and all sorts of other goodies. Okay? Um, more and green spending is the same way. There are zillions of businesses who make their living off of green spending. Their main customer is the federal government. So of course they would like the federal government to always be spending more on cleaner energies and so forth. Okay? So there are strong biases toward too much spending. So we shouldn't have assumed back in February of 2009 that clearly we were spending too little. There was a very strong possibility. We were already spending too much from a cost benefit productivity perspective. Before committing additional dollars, okay, additional expenditure on any of these activities, we should have wanted to see compelling, convincing, calm, rational analyses. The administration never offered anything like that. What it offered was assertions. More spending is always good. Okay? 
That's incredibly unpersuasive and is almost certainly not true in many of those instances. Okay? And so that's the uh, third part of the reason to be incredibly suspicious. Finally, the reason to be suspicious of the cost-benefit argument for more spending is, how is it that you can actually find those projects that make sense? By taking your time, by having economists, accountants, lawyers, and others study the issue, by doing careful cost-benefit analyses. But in a crisis, in 2009, we didn't do any of those things. We didn't take the time to figure out what projects made sense and what projects didn't. We just decided that there were zillions of shovel-ready things to be spent on that were good projects, and we were going to plow ahead and spend money as fast as possible. Let me give one illustration of how loony that notion is. I live in Wellesley, Massachusetts, which is next door to Newton, Massachusetts. <coughs> going back about nine or 10 years, Newton decided they were going to build a new high school. They fought about it, argued about it, spent tons of money on consultants and designs and architects and all that. About five years, they finally built the thing. It was unmitigated disaster. The heating didn't work, the cooling didn't work, the internet didn't work, the parking was a mess. I mean, it was just a huge, huge, huge mess. Partially, I guess, because it was designed by a committee. Committees tend to sort of muck things up. Okay? So they had all the time in the world, okay, and they got it seriously wrong. Wellesley okay, is actually just doing the construction now after having spent five, six years arguing about it. Okay? And it's going to take another three years. So even if it comes out perfectly, which it probably won't, it still took eight years for that project. Those examples fly in the face of the notion that at any point in time, there's tons of shovel-ready stuff and that therefore the government can just spend like a drunken sailor and it will be good for the economy, it will be productive. Okay? The reality is incredibly different. So, let's look at the other possible argument okay, for the additional spending. Okay? I'm not going to go through as much of the gory detail, but to remind you, the argument for strictly Keynesian spending says that the government pays people to dig ditches and fill them back up, that's good for the economy. That's what the model literally says. If the government hires people to make toaster ovens or cars or computers and throw them in the ocean, that's good for the economy. That's what the model literally says. Okay? Now, you may think that's just completely insane and you should just stop there. It turns out if you make enough weedy, wonky, complicated assumptions, you can almost make that argument seem sort of rational. But it's still a model. It's still a lot of assumptions. You shouldn't take it at face value. We shouldn't regard it as God's truth. We should subject it to empirical examination, which is what economists do with every model that economists propose. So it only makes sense to rely on it if there's good evidence to support it. Relatedly, we should only rely on the Keynesian model and particularly emphasis on spending if the evidence says that spending is much better at stimulating the economy than tax cuts. Okay? So what does the evidence say? The evidence says okay, pretty clearly not totally unambiguously, but pretty clearly that there's very little evidence to think, sorry, something just, I hit something by mistake. Um, God is striking me down. Um, the evidence says pretty strongly that spending is not very effective at stimulating the economy. The evidence says quite clearly that tax cuts are very effective at stimulating the economy. Now that which makes a lot of sense. What happens when governments cut tax rates? Okay? It increases the incentive for people to save, to work, to invest. That's good for the economy. It leads to a more productive economy. Okay? So if the Keynesian model is true, then tax cuts are good for the economy. Okay? If it's not true, but the standard microeconomics about tax cuts is right, which lots and lots of evidence supports, then the tax cuts are still good for the economy. If the evidence is approximately right, then the spending increases are not especially good for the economy. So what would a prudent person have done? I think a prudent person would have emphasized the stimulus based on tax cuts, not on spending increases. So what did we do? We adopted a stimulus that was almost entirely based on spending increases. My advisors from MIT are trying to punish me somehow. Um, the, the, the particular stimulus we enacted okay, was almost all spending, very little on tax cuts. The few tax cuts it contained okay, were not designed to improve incentives, to give people added incentive to work, save, and invest. Okay, much of the spending was explicitly sort of bad for incentives, if not, even if perhaps compassionate. Obvious example is very much extended unemployment insurance benefits. 
Okay? Extending unemployment insurance may be the compassionate thing to do, but it's clearly going to keep the unemployment rate high. It's clearly going to keep the economy in a relatively low level of activity, not encourage sort of economic growth. <laughs> So from this perspective, the one that I just described, tax cuts make a lot of sense, extra spending doesn't. Okay? The Democrats got it almost entirely wrong. Okay? So why? Okay? Is it that the economists in the administration think my view is completely wacky? Okay? I don't know. I haven't asked them. Okay? But I don't think so. And lots of economists okay, are certainly sympathetic to the views that I've enunciated. I think the reason is that the spending that was undertaken by the stimulus all rewards democratic interest groups. Okay? Increased spending on green energy rewards the environmental lobby. Increased transfers to states allows them to avoid laying off public sector employees and teachers, okay? two incredibly important democratic interest groups. Okay? Um, increased spending on infrastructure, on roads and so forth, okay? rewards con construction unions and, and sends a bright signal to unions more generally. Okay? So the administration tilted its economic stimulus unbelievably, incredibly heavily toward paying off its democratic base, not toward economic efficiency. And it would have been trivial to have designed a stimulus that was consistent with the evidence and the principles that I've outlined. It would have meant cutting corporate income tax rates, cutting personal income tax rates, cutting employment taxes. Okay? Those things would have all gotten very sympathetic hearings from economists. Okay? They're changes that make sense whether or not there's a recession. They're all consistent with the Keynesian model as well. Those things would all work even in a strictly Keynesian perspective. All those things were actually likely to work much faster than the extra spending. You don't need any time to enact and announce a tax cut. And the people who are going to go get the tax cut can realize immediately that they're going to get it and start thinking about spending that money okay, in productive ways, new investment projects, right away, whereas the spending stimulus inevitably had to take time. So, to summarize my view on the stimulus, I think it was badly designed from the perspectives of efficiency and from productivity. It was badly designed relative to the evidence. An enormous missed opportunity, it was an enormous missed opportunity because the administration could have made the structure of the economy better in a way which would have addressed the recession and been better for growth going forward over the long haul. So let me talk about a few other policies to suggest that this is a general tendency, the emphasis on dividing the pie over growing the pie. Okay. Other obvious example to discuss is Obamacare. Okay. Been clearly the preoccupation of the administration for about a year. What does Obamacare mean exactly? Roughly, it means a mandate that everyone has to buy insurance, point one. Point two, it means substantial subsidies for many of the people who are being mandated to buy insurance because you can't mandate that someone with an income of 30,000 a year has to spend 15 or 20,000 a year of that on a health insurance premium. So, of course, there are going to be subsidies okay, for people to be able to afford the health insurance. And then there's a lot of regulation of the health insurance industry geared toward making it possible for everyone to always get coverage at a relatively low premium. That is, restrictions on whether insurance companies could drop people from coverage, uh, community rating, which means basically everybody pays the same premium, and bans on pre-existing condition clauses. So anyone, anytime, regardless of medical history, can get insurance and pays the same rate as everyone else. The claim the administration made for this is that this was going to be good for everyone. That not only were we going to cover another 30 to 40 million people with health insurance, okay, but we were going to create lower premiums for everybody who already has health insurance, and we weren't going to have to reduce the amount of health care obtained by anybody in the economy. Okay. Okay. Obviously, if you could pull that off, you should do it. Okay. That would be a great thing if anybody could do it. Okay. But it was utterly implausible on its face. Okay? You just have to think about how much it would cost to insure another 30 to 40 million people to realize that doing that while saving money okay, is just the arithmetic couldn't possibly add up. Okay? Now, the administration, of course, offered a bunch of reasons why they asserted that their program would, in fact, lead to increased coverage, lower cost for everyone, and no reduction in care. They talked about things like doing comparative effectiveness research, 
doing research on medical practices, deciding which ones are actually most effective, and trying to make every doctor use those rather than sometimes using relatively costly and ineffective procedures. Okay? They talked about trying to reduce emergency room use, getting people into regular insurance plans so we would save a lot of money from reduced use of emergency rooms. They talked about increasing competition through various forms of regulation. The problem is that none of their assertions about how they would save money okay, is remotely plausible or consistent with the existing evidence. Okay? To give an example, the comparative effectiveness research certainly identifies instances where some hospitals are doing things in a high cost way, others are doing them in a low cost way. But when you look at the details, you see that there are reasons that it isn't trivial to just use the low cost procedure on the high cost patients. Many of the high cost patients were high cost for a reason. They were subtly different than the low cost patients and that's why the doctors used more expensive procedure. So of course, you could impose the low cost procedure on everyone. That would save money, but it would save money by reducing care. It's not the claim that you couldn't reduce cost that was, in, that was incorrect. It's a claim that you could do it okay, without any sacrifice okay, in the amount of care people provide. So the evidence for the claim okay, was just not there. Okay? And so the claims are incredibly unpersuasive. Why did they make those claims? Because if the administration had gotten up and said, you know what, it's the just right thing to do for us to provide generous health insurance to everybody who doesn't have it, that probably would have been voted down in the Congress. It probably would not have commanded enough popular support. Okay, so instead, they dressed it up as being efficient, as being a win-win for everyone to sell it to the American public, but the evidence does not back that up. Just a couple more, a few more quick examples. Another major initiative was housing. The administration's main objective there was to prevent foreclosures. Okay, now that sounds like a compassionate goal, but it's not an efficient goal. It's in fact directly contrary to what good economics would suggest because the vast majority of people at risk of foreclosure are very unlikely to ever be able to afford the houses that they're in because other people might be able to afford those houses if they were resold at lower prices. And so the administration is not making the housing market more efficient even though they made some assertions to that effect. They're simply redistributing resources to a group, sort of low middle income households, okay, who don't want to be forced out of their homes. Indeed, US housing policy long before President Obama has taken the same tack. It's insisted that everyone should get a house independent of the inability to pay. Okay? That's a redistribution. It's not anything that you can justify as being an efficient way to utilize society's resources. The auto bailout is another example. Okay? Now, economists disagree. Obviously, the populace generally disagrees a lot about the uh, banking industry bailouts, the Wall Street bailouts. Whatever you think about the, the banking bailouts, okay, for them, against them, there was no case for the auto bailouts. There was no risk that having GM and Chrysler go through bankruptcy, standard bankruptcy, would have done anything particular to the rest of the economy. Okay, and therefore, there was no reason to intervene okay, in those particular bankruptcies. Why did the administration do it? Because it engineered bankruptcy outcomes, which gave a lot less money to creditors and a lot more money to the unions. In the standard way a bankruptcy would have proceeded, the creditors would have been higher in the pecking order as the claimants on the remaining value of those companies, okay? and they would have gotten more relative to labor, but in fact the administration intervened in a way that gave much more to labor, both through the settlement of the bankruptcy and through the bailouts that went directly uh, to the auto companies. Again, there was no economic efficiency justification. Okay? It was just a way to redistribute to a favored interest group of uh, the, the administration and Democrats in Congress in particular. One last example is cap and trade. Now cap and trade seems to be dead in the water in Congress. It doesn't look as though it's actually going to get enacted, but it's still a, a useful illustration. What is cap and trade? It's a system where the government will decree that there's only a certain number of permits available for the whole country to be able to emit carbon dioxide. Okay? It's an attempt to reduce the burning of fossil fuel. The standard justifications are that this will help promote energy independence, that this will um, reduce our uh, global warming, reduce pollution. Okay? Whatever you think about those claims, okay, I will certainly uh, a global warming skeptic, but set that aside. Assume you take those claims seriously okay, and you say if you were going to try to reduce fossil fuel use, okay, what policy would you use? Well, economists would all say to a person, carbon taxes. Why? A carbon tax raises the price of CO2, of emitting CO2, 
You can see it. It's clear. It's simple. You know, there's no big deal of how you enforce it. Okay? It would do exactly what you want it to do. Cap and trade is a different approach. It's setting a restriction on the amount rather than targeting the price. Now, if you did it in the right way, it turns out it's exactly equivalent. Okay? You could just say, we're going to limit the amount of CO2. Then the equilibrium price of emitting CO2 will go up. It will be the price of the permits that allow you to emit the CO2. And we're going to auction off the permits to be able to do this. So the government will still get the revenue from the right to emit CO2 and will get less of it. So the two things would be equivalent. Okay? And that's, in fact, exactly what candidate Obama <coughs> proposed. Okay? Cap and trade auctioning off the permits. Okay? President Obama and the Democratic Congress okay, have a bill that's languishing in committee that says they're going to give away the permits, most of the permits. Why? Because if you give away the permits, then you can reward your friends. Then you can give <laughs> permits more to some states than other states, more to some industries than other industries. You can let the environmental lobby dictate what sorts of activities they think deserve permits and which do not. It's totally about paying off Democratic interest groups. There's no good efficiency argument for it, and it will arbitrarily reward some groups within the economy rather than others. So let me summarize what I've said so far and then talk about the future. My claim is, across the board, politics, that is redistribution toward the Democratic base, has governed the way the administration has chosen policy, okay, not concerns about making the economy efficient and promoting overall economic growth. Okay? So what does that mean for the future? Well, what is the issue for the future? I think economists are pretty united in thinking the crucial issue is the debt. It's the fact that okay, we have high deficits. They're projected to stay high for quite a number of years. And in particular, if Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security grow at the rates that are forecast, okay, and those are, pretty, are likely to be pretty good forecasts, okay, then those three items will eat the entire budget, indeed will eat the entire economy in a few decades. So that means the US either has to cut a bunch of other stuff to avoid runaway debt, but actually even if you cut all the other stuff, okay, there's still a problem because the other stuff is just not that big a portion of the budget, especially given how fast Medicare and Medicaid are growing. Or to reduce the debt, you have to raise taxes a lot, but raising taxes enough to reduce the debt, to get the deficits under control, would be enormously costly for economic growth. So the US needs to address that issue. Now, President Obama had a chance to fix it. He had a chance to get up and say things like, we're going to gradually phase in a higher age of eligibility for Social Security and Medicare. That would have done a lot to slow the growth of those programs without sort of, in, without doing terrible harm to the beneficiaries. You wouldn't have done it, obviously, on current beneficiaries or even on people who are near being beneficiaries, but on people who are 55 or younger. Under some policy change, they would have been told to expect benefits from Social Security and Medicare to somewhat sort of older age. But he didn't do that. Okay? And it's useful to think about a quote from Rahm Emanuel, who's one of the key advisors to President Obama. Just after the election, Emanuel said, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste because it provides the opportunity for us to do things that, th that you think you could not do before. Now, Emmanuel obviously meant it was an the crisis was an opportunity for the Democrats to do things that they hadn't been able to do before. But his broader point is actually, his point is still broader. It was an opportunity for Obama to do things that no politician okay, was going to have an easy time doing because there's so much political resistance to slowing the growth of entitlements. Okay. Obama could have chosen a stimulus based on tax cuts. He could have slowed Medicare and Medicaid. He could have expanded trade. He could have reformed the tax code. Tons of things that make lots and lots of sense that are very difficult in normal times. Instead, okay, they emphasized the redistribution and rewarded their constituency. Now, unfortunately, while that's sad, it's hardly unexpected. Okay. Why? Because in my view, it's impossible to be too cynical about politicians. Okay? Politicians are in the business of getting elected. That's what they are, is people who try to get elected. So they're going to do what seems to make sense to them. And at least until pretty recently, the Democrats were doing what seemed to make sense to them given their constituents. Democrats don't run necessarily in districts that are high five of the whole country, certainly for the House. Each member runs in a district that may have a particular composition that supports a liberal perspective. 
So many Democratic congressmen okay, are going to take liberal positions because that's what's going to get them reelected, regardless of okay, the economic merits or demerits of the particular policies. Now I want to emphasize that if you think that what happened is politicians were cynical, the Democrats did things that they thought were good for their constituents and would help them get reelected, you should also not be very optimistic at the prospect that, say, the Republicans will retake the White House and Congress in 2012. Because Republican politicians are also politicians. They also try to get reelected. They also endorse policies that seem to be good for their reelection at the time, but are not necessarily good for them overall. The eight years under Bush okay, are a good illustration. The Bush and the Republican Congress in particular gave us no child left behind, okay, a federal takeover of education. Okay? It gave us a prescription drug benefit added to Medicare, a huge expansion in an entitlement. Okay? It gave us huge amounts of pork and earmarks, okay? all counterproductive to fiscal discipline. And nothing the administration did seriously reduce the growth of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and so on. Okay? So we didn't get okay, better policies okay, under the Republicans either. So where is there some avenue okay, for hope? Okay, if you have my cynical view okay, about politicians and what they're likely to do. I think the hope, in a word, is gridlock. Okay? By gridlock, I mean a situation where the president is one party and at least one of the houses of Congress is some other party, and significantly so, so that it's very hard for either party to ram through things that just rewards its base. It has to okay, accommodate the other side okay, in order to get anything passed. Okay? So a few things to note. First, gridlock is probably coming in the near term for the US because it looks as though Democrats will lose a lot of seats. They may or may not lose their majority, but they're likely to lose a lot of seats. And so Obama may have to compromise a lot more. Okay? As a libertarian, I'm certainly not saying I think gridlock is perfect. Libertarians would like to repeal more or less every policy adopted since the 90s. And when they say that, they mean the 1790s. Okay? <laughs> But while not being perfect, okay, gridlock has the potential to be reasonably good. For the last six years of the Clinton administration, we had that situation. During that period, okay, we reformed welfare in a way which was reasonable, not exactly what libertarians would do, but certainly in a sensible direction. Okay. During that period, we had reasonably decent economic growth. During that period, the budget okay, moved from deficit to surplus, and so on. So I think the best chance Okay, to do something constructive, to achieve some moderation in the growth of the entitlements that would address the fiscal situation and so on, okay, is if we have a government that has strong representation from both sides where neither party can impose its will on the other. Okay? So let me just leave you with two brief sort of summaries and thoughts. The first is the key issue for the US, I think, is the debt. Okay? Unless we get that under control, we're going to start facing much higher interest rates at which we borrow in international markets. That is, the Chinese won't want to hold our debt at low interest rates. That will raise the deficits even more, and you could end up in a vicious spiral where we end up looking like Argentina in the 1980s. Okay? So the key economic issue is the deficit. I think the best way to end up with a government that does sensible policies is for people to not believe basically anything that the politicians say and always vote against the party in power. <laughs> if you live in a state, <laughs> so for me in Massachusetts, that usually means voting Republican. In other states, it means the reverse. But put pressure on all of them to have to respond by having there be balance in government. One-sided government is a disaster, and it doesn't matter which side. Okay, it's having either party have total control of policymaking. That is a recipe for economic disaster. Thank you very much. I think there are mics that will come around for people with questions. This will be going back a few years, so I have a question for you concerning that. Um, the uh, so as an alternative, uh, what would have happened, what would you expect would have happened if uh, uh, in 2008 the bond had been defeated and the Republicans, uh, if, well, Senator McCain seems to have befuddled some by some of the economic issues, but this should be a continuation of the sort of Bush administration policies of some kind. What would you have expected to, uh, the decisions, major decisions to have made in these different areas? Well, again, I think it would have depended on the composition of Congress 
Okay? I think that if we had the Democratic Congress and a McCain presidency, in some areas we would have had sort of pretty sensible compromise. Now, President, I mean, uh, Senator McCain is an unusual character. He's got very liberal views on a lot of issues. And my own pop psychology is that Senator McCain likes to be liked. So I'm not sure he would have stood up there and really fought for a consistently sort of small government you know, perspective. I think he would have compromised kind of right, left, and center because he likes being popular. So I wouldn't have been super optimistic about that particular combination. But there are issues where he certainly would have stuck to his guns. He's certainly not you know, a big tax increase person. He would have resisted that sort of thing. Whether he would have stood up and tried to really get the entitlements under control, I suspect not. If you have bureaucrats in Washington making decisions about where money is going to get spent, okay, it's not going to involve the thought of a small business owner or a large business owner who says, should I build another factory or not? Okay, should I build a factory in this part of the country or another part of the country, overseas or domestically? Should I? They're not going to be thinking through the costs and benefits in the way that you were hinting at. But secondly, I'm sort of confused that if you had 5% more of your, your revenue that you could keep, that you wouldn't either use that okay, to consume more stuff, in which case you would tend to be better off and you would be buying goods and services from other parts of the economy, or that you would say, gee, if I have that more cash flow, I can afford to open another branch, another franchise, or add another product, another line of business, and things like that. I guess I would offer that I've heard different suggestions from lots of other people, and that the evidence on what happens when governments cut taxes is that you do get more economic growth, and certainly there are lots of plausible reasons why that makes sense. So I guess we have to leave it at that. Yeah? Uh, next year, we have uh, tax increases coming in, even if Obamacare is not passed. And we also recently had the abolition of the welfare reform in 1994. So welfare recipients now can stay on welfare all of their lives if they want. Uh, would you hear a forecast of what these two things together are going to do to future unemployment in the next few years? Um. I, I don't like forecasting anything that has a number and a date in it at the same time. Um, but the, the change in the welfare, I mean, that's certainly going to go in the direction of a higher reported unemployment rate. I don't know that literature well enough to, to talk about a number. The tax increases, if you take as given the estimates that are out there, they could certainly contribute a, point or, a percentage point or two to the unemployment rate. Okay, given what evidence from you know, people like David and Christy Romer okay, um, about how much taxes are bad for the economy. The particular proposals that people have made, were making sort of five years ago about what was being called privatizing were not going to address the growth of Social Security benefits because what those were doing was allowing people to take some of their taxes that they would otherwise put pay to the government would go in a Social Security trust fund and say, instead, you can put those in a 401k-like account. Well, what effect does that have on the solvency of the trust fund? It makes it worse because less money is going into the trust fund. Now, if you simultaneously cut the benefits to which that person is entitled by an actuarially equivalent amount, then you haven't changed the solvency of the trust fund. If you cut the benefits of the person who's getting this private account by more, well, then you've improved the solvency. But you didn't need to give them a private account to do that. So the crucial way to privatize Social Security is to pay less benefits. That's the meaningful way to do it. That's the only way which actually makes it more solvent. Now, what I was sort of, half of the devil half of me was hoping and the angel half of me was rooting against was that what would happen is that the Republicans would sell the country privatization as though it were a free lunch, even though it's not, for the reasons I explained. But buried in the details on page 3 million of the, of the bill, okay, <laughs> there, would be, there would be little tricky fixes to sort of the rate at which benefits were indexed and how things were rounded up versus rounded down. And so those tricks would actually promote solvency, okay, even though the creation of the private's account doesn't promote solvency, but it didn't happen one way or the other. If you took a bunch of identical people who didn't have insurance, who had identical risks, health characteristics, et cetera, and thought about each of them as individually buying insurance, 
each would have to pay a fairly high premium because there would be a lot of risk for the insurer for any given individual. If you could pool them all together, then you'd be pretty confident that the average amount you'd have to pay out would be some reasonable estimate and so you could offer a lower premium. So if you were starting with identical people and just diversifying the risk, just like if you flip a coin many, many, many times, you can be pretty confident that the average, average it's going to come out sort of heads. But the proposals are to force into the same pool people of very different risks. And there will be systematic biases into who is willing to go into the pool and who doesn't. And so we will be forcing people who are currently healthy, paying relatively low premiums, to be in the pool with people who are unhealthy. And so some people will pay higher premiums and some people will pay lower premiums. There's no free lunch from forcing all those people of differing health risks into the same pool. So there's a set of assumptions under which that statement can be made correct, but that's not the scenario that we actually face. Okay, so there, there's sort of two ways to answer that. If the question is how could we slow the growth of the existing programs, make the existing programs more efficient, there's an answer that most economists would give. Okay, one, reduce, ideally eliminate, the tax preference for employer-provided health care. And the crucial thing is that because you're, in effect, being subsidized through your employers, you're going to buy a more generous plan with fewer copays and deductibles, so you're going to demand more health care without thinking about the cost. So economists very broadly would support that. Secondly, introducing more copays and deductibles into Medicare, okay, for the same basic reasons. Okay, and uh, more broadly, you could think about eliminating some of the barriers to entry into practicing medicine, such as allowing a lot more foreign trained residents and doctors to work in the United States, expanding care and lowering prices and things like that. If the question is, what can you do to provide much greater coverage, much greater access to affordable health insurance, okay, that's a much harder question because they're inevitable trade-offs. So whatever you do is going to have some non-trivial cost. What Paul Ryan has proposed, I think, is as close as you can get to some, it, it, is a very good attempt at balancing all those costs and benefits. It says, give everyone a health insurance voucher, just to have a round number, assume it's say 10,000 a person. So every person has 10,000 that they can spend on health insurance, but not on anything else. It's a voucher. Okay? Now, if you do that, okay, some people are going to have health status that's going to require a lot more than can be paid for by that $10,000 a year policy. That $10,000 might buy you a relatively a, a generous policy without much copays and deductibles, or much more generous but with copays and deductibles. But some people are not going to be able to buy all the health care they could possibly want just by getting that $10,000 voucher. So there's still going to, be, going to be an issue of some people not always getting care paid for, okay, who don't have the ability to pay for it themselves. But there isn't any system that would do that, that would give everybody access to all health care under all circumstances without regard to ability to pay, that would not also destroy the, ec the economy. So you have to balance that somewhere. Somebody has to you know, not get something some of the time. Ryan's proposal of universal vouchers, okay, I think, is, is the least bad of the approaches. If you say no one can ever be denied okay, because of a pre-existing condition, well then, first of all, you have to define what it means for something to be a pre-existing condition. You have to have a list of all the things that are called a pre-existing condition. Okay? So when people talk about this, I guarantee you most of them have in their head, oh, someone was born okay, with a certain gene that causes a disease later in life. Totally just all bad luck. Okay? But there's a whole set of things that will end up being included as pre-existing conditions that are partially or maybe substantially behavior. Okay? Downhill skiing where you break your leg, smoking cigarettes, consuming you know, so many calories that you're significantly overweight, you, excessive use of alcohol or drugs, or all sorts of other things. So if you say, we give everybody the same premium, okay, no matter what they did to contribute to their own bad health, okay, then there's going to be a cross-subsidy from people who are more healthy, more responsible, to people who are less healthy, less responsible, and also from people who are lucky 
by being born with good genes to people who are unlucky, okay, and born with lousy health genes. So that's a tough question. That's really not a question economists know how to answer. That's a moral ethical question. But society has to recognize that there is a trade-off. You can't just give everything to everybody without destroying the overall economy, because if we did, then all dollars would be spent on health care. Can you identify any political figures who espouse your views and really understand these issues? Um, there's, I would say, Paul Ryan, absolutely. Paul Ryan is just absolutely terrific. Okay. I don't, have no idea what Paul Ryan's views are on foreign policy or social issues. Okay, but, so I've only read what he says about economics. And I'm not necessarily endorsing every single thing in his Roadmap 2.0. They're sort of wonky, minor things I might quibble about. But overall, Paul Ryan is fantastic on the economics. On the other person um, is Gar Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico. And full disclosure, I'm sort of an informal economic advisor for him. But he is uh, explicitly a libertarian and adopts a libertarian view, right or wrong, but he takes a libertarian view on economic policy very, very consistently. Um, I think Barry Goldwater was actually excellent as well, but he's, he's not running for office anymore. <laughs> if you can't find the power in the Constitution to do it, then don't pass up. We don't have that many choices. All you can do is vote out people who voted in favor of this, that's deeming the legislation past fix. I mean, we will get an opportunity. Every single member of the House is up for re-election in just about six months. So I guarantee you, they are quaking in their boots that there will be exactly a reaction. It will be widespread, and incumbents will get voted out at a much higher rate than usually occurs. Usually, the incumbents get re-elected, like 98%. OK, that, that, that's a fair point. Um, I, I'm quite confident. I know of groups that are planning to file suits Okay, to challenge the constitutionality, whether it's done, even actually if it's done uh, without the, uh, the hand-waving, even if they had the 60 votes, okay, there's still a question of whether the federal constitution allows the federal government to mandate health insurance. But that aside, there will be constitutional challenges. Okay? So that's the other mechanism. Whether they'll get very far, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh